ants were the first to leave. Nobody noticed. They were so caught up in the dire ills of their day, screen sickness, political corruption, unending police brutality, the rains and the droughts and the fires and the floods. They didn't notice the ants, masterful and methodical, pack up and leave. These were not the ants that live in human dwellings, tracking a gentle path from the sink to the cabinet to the unknown place behind the stove. Those ants were human kin and wouldn't leave without them. The ants that left first were the ants that live in places unseen by humans. Yes, toadstool, yes, leaf mold, but yes, also grassy swaths where the verdage is so thick it cushions against human trod. Places where humans no longer stoop to peer. Once the human knee lost its ability to squat, stooping and peering happened at a much lower rate. The ants left some smells behind. The fragrance of pizza parlors and gasoline dripping from the fuel nozzle onto hot tarmac the aroma of roasting chestnuts and the mystery scent that floats up from subway grates. Those were human-owned smells. The ants took the smells of gathering clouds and impending rain and the lustful smell as the rain soaks into the damp earth after. They took the electric aroma that precedes a snowfall and the smell of the static stillness after. The ants took the smell of the the fruity deepening of summer and the muddy agitation of spring. The smells that the ants took were the smells of before and after, the aroma of just around the corner and slipping away, the smells that stretch time on a continuum from anticipation to nostalgia. They left behind a hormone trail of breadcrumbs, a guide for the next to give up. It was the gnomes. Who could blame them? Creatures that exist at such a delicate vibration, retreating farther and farther from noise and machines, beeping, buzzing, backup beeping, more backup beeping, mower blades and tire treads flattening toadstools of every variety, indiscriminate of the gathering spots, the nectar stations, the sweet water posts, the joyful noise platoons, the nut and leaf bars. Too many flattened, too many gone. The gnomes retreating inward and inward to the remaining patches of forest and field until they were becoming overcrowded with refugee gnomes and the situation was becoming untenable. The gnomes caught the whiff of the ants' trail, filled their flasks with the dew of their home moss, and trekked away. The humans didn't notice the gnomes' absence either, not at first. It was the hikers, hunters, and forest bathers who, upon entering their usual haunts, the forest or the meadow or the brook at the edge of the field, it felt flat. It felt one-dimensional, no different from the sidewalk or the Staples parking lot. Where was the feeling of centering you got when you entered the forest, the feeling of grounding? Even leaning their backs against the trunk of a tree, they could no longer feel its life pulse the way they used to no longer feel their spirit reaching its roots down into the loamy soil, no longer taste the fullness of the earth in the damp forest air. They could not feel the ancestral timelessness that permeates the land. The fairies thought they wouldn't miss the gnomes, dull, ground-dwelling creatures that they were. The fairies passed much time plucking stamen from flowers and dropping them on the gnomes' heads, which erupted the gnomes in ferocious bouts of sneezing and left golden smears of pollen down the sides of their caps. The fairies thought this uproariously funny until, inevitably, the gnomes would retaliate by shaking the stems of flowers within whose blossoms the fairies took their deep afternoon repose, which allowed them to delight through the even morn. Lacking a solid nap, the fairies were too drowsy for starlight twinkle carousing and could barely make it through their morning task of helping the flowers wake up. At first, the fairies were glad to be freed of their ground-dwelling adversaries who could only reach height by climbing the fungal shelf ladders they so diligently installed in the sides of trees. But soon, they noticed that it was becoming more and more difficult to alight upon a flower. Lacking the counterbalance of roots and gravitas, the fairies were growing more buoyant each day, and so concerned that they would float away forever. The fairies fashioned traveling cloaks from their favorite flower petals, picked up the scent of the ants' trail, and left. It wasn't just the hikers, hunters, and forest folk who were concerned now. The gardeners grew anxious at the lack of glitter in the garden. The farmers, out at dawn, noticed that the dew was absent of diamonds. It hung flat. Even the morning spider webs, the jewel shop of the yard, 
simply hung now with water, unshining. The witches, too, and the herbalists grew concerned. The witches could no longer see the special way a plant dances or the glowing aura of a plant who wants to make magic. The herbalists could no longer hear the whispers of the plants who wanted to become medicine. Some of these kind folk didn't think to raise the alarm. They second-guessed themselves, questioned their judgment. Perhaps their vision was blurry, their intuition was off, or they hadn't had their morning cup of coffee. Others tried to raise the alarm, but were ignored. They weren't surprised. They were used to people not listening to them. It was then that the bees began to leave. Without the, peri, the fairy stationed at the morning blossoms, pointing and directing and generally harassing the bees, they had little motivation or resource to endure the drudgery of pollination. For some flowers, the pollination situation is straightforward enough. You go in, do your thing, and leave. But for others, the instructions are wildly complicated. Just to enter the flower, you have to hook your leg in a notch and twist just so to get in. Then go to the bottom, do your thing, but then to get out, you have to find and then wiggle your way through an escape hatch. No getting out the way you come in. A bee could die if she gets it wrong. Not worth it. Not without the fairies sitting at the edge of the petals barking instructions the whole time. The honeybees left first, thankless servants to humans all these years. It was then that people began to notice. Facebook posts were shared and reshared. Marketing appeared that was just subtle enough to not outright suggest that climate change was real. There were campaigns by farmers, gardeners, and naturalists to plant larval hopes and pollinator attractants. But it was too late. The wasps and the hornets held out as long as they could, stubborn as always, yet long willing to perform the task of pollination. It wasn't until the bumblebees left that everybody noticed. Even people who only experienced the outdoors via windows and walks to and from their car, even they noticed. This is because the bumblebees took with them the first layer of sound. The amphitheater of space around human life, layers of existence. The sound that holds life within a place. Everybody noticed the loss of this first layer of sound and panicked. For a moment, there was hysteria. But once the bumblebees left, the crickets were soon to follow. And the cicadas, the katydids, the harvest flies, then the morning songbirds and stray crows, each taking with them a layer of sound, a layer of existence a supporting beam in the frame of dimension around human life. And by the time the last pigeon had flown the stoop, human life had become thin and strung out, lacking in any dimension, completely flat. So flat, in fact, that they didn't even notice. <laughs>